All right, hi, uh, hi everybody. Welcome to uh, my session on tactical advice for hiring developers. Um, I figure usually I like to give people a few minutes to trickle in because there's so much going on today. Um, I'm Matt DeCure, and today is April 27th, so thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today, uh, setting realistic expectations, um, hiring as marketing, diversity and inclusion in hiring, putting your employees in a position to succeed, and of course also being open-minded. <coughs> Uh, so quick housekeeping, uh, the law of two feet is like, if you don't want to be in the session, you'd rather be somewhere else, it's okay to leave. You're not going to offend me, it's mini bar, there are a million sessions going on today, and like, there are other sessions that I would like to be at right now too. So like, totally cool if you leave in the middle. <laughs> like, people are going to trickle in in the next like 15, 20 minutes, and that's cool too. So, uh, but thank you for coming to at least to the beginning of my talk. So who am I? Uh, I'm a self-taught software engineer. Uh, I'm the founder of Minneapolis Junior Devs which was born here a couple years ago, and also the Invisible Network, which is uh, the thing that I just quit my job to, to focus on, and I'll talk more about it a little bit as we go. But um, I'm, also, I'm also on the Make It MSP Tech Steering Committee. Uh, personally, I've gone through a handful of job searches and uh, gone through rounds of hiring junior developers at my last job. Um, I'm also a pizza enthusiast, and I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, so the background for this talk is uh, at Make It MSP, we, did a, we had a, a workshop in February, um, and we had a really good panel that was specifically to address um, the junior dev hiring problem, which is to say sort of the mismatch in expectations between junior devs who are looking for work and companies that say they hire junior devs. Um, it was a really good panel, a really good panel discussion, and the feedback we got from employers after the event was that they wanted more tactical advice uh, and specific like recommendations for things they can do. And so that's sort of where the whole idea for this session came from. Um, so why you're here, uh, and I, we might do a little bit of live audience polling here in a moment, but presumably you're here because you need to hire developers urgently. Like there are a remarkable number of sessions today on hiring, um, hiring engineers, um, and like Paul DeBedding's session. Who, who, who was at Paul DeBedding's session earlier today? Okay, cool. All right, so there's at least a couple of us. Um, this is, this is like a common trend at this point, which is like companies are like aggressively trying to hire developers and they're all vying for the same people and they can't find them. So there's like a shortage in, in supply, right? Uh, so by a show of hands, how many of you are hiring and hiring developers? Great, a good number of employers here. This is fantastic. Okay, now how many of you are hiring junior? Four of you, great, okay. Uh, and how many of you are looking for experienced developers? Okay, that's everybody else. Um, all right, so like <laughs> this exemplifies the problem, and so hopefully some of the things that we talk about today are going to get at sort of ways to address them. Um, so my advice, of course, depends on who you're looking to hire. Um, if you're looking for experienced devs, I think Paul sort of already spoke to this. Um, the market is very, very hot right now, and so expect finding an experienced developer to be time consuming, and also expect them to, I mean, expect to pay them a lot because they're choosing between many different companies. Like they're getting courted aggressively by companies right now. Um, for junior devs, um, on the flip side, Prime, uh, Software Guild, uh, the UMN uh, bootcamp, they're sort of like flooding the market with candidates, which is a good thing. But what that means is if you open up like an associate software engineer position, you're gonna get inundated with candidates, which is both good and bad, right? Um, but you can expect them to be motivated and eager to learn which is really, really great. Um, but also with that, you need to sort of train them and like put them in a position to succeed by mentoring, onboarding, and training them. <coughs> uh, all right, so first sort of uh, uh, umbrella category that we're gonna talk about is setting realistic expectations. Um, and the first thing there is timing. Like how long will it take to, to hire someone? Um, I did some internet research and the average that I, that, um, I found on the internet was it takes about 12 weeks time between like posting a job, like opening up a job and making an offer. Like that's a long ass time. Um, and there, there are other stats out there like that, that break down more details between like time between, I forget all the details, but the, the point is that like, this is just like a, like an umbrella number to say to hire an engineer, it takes you three months. That doesn't necessarily factor in 
the, the breakdown by different experience levels. So if you're hiring junior, you could probably get somebody, you could probably make an offer and find somebody to start in maybe like two months if you're like aggressive about it and quick. Um, on the flip side, for an experienced engineer, that could take you like a year. Um, and so this is all anecdata. data. This is all like, like none of it's supported by like real world numbers, but this is sort of generally speaking the, um, the read that I'm seeing on the market. So uh, time to hire for an entry level or junior dev is like between two and four months. Um, for a mid-level, like three to six months. And then for senior, it can vary wildly. So like it could take you three months if you find somebody quickly, but it could also take up to like a whole year. Um, and then that doesn't even factor into account how much time it takes to get them up to speed. So like you're like, oh, we need to hire somebody yesterday. Like we need somebody like ideally you would have somebody working at your company yesterday who like already knows everything about how your teams work, how your products work, the Git repos and all that stuff, and like is ready to go. I don't think uh, those. <laughs> <laughs> all right, great. Yeah, just uh, take a number. Uh, so, so like the, uh, that onboarding time, like onboarding takes time. I feel like just generally speaking, even if you're super experienced, it's going to take you at least three months to get up to speed. Um, you might be making commits and whatnot here um, early on in in your time there, like maybe within the first couple weeks, but like you're not going to like fully know a repo until you've spent time working in it. Um, and so like, just trying to put that all into perspective, like that senior developer could be ready to go and be like a contributing member to a team in anywhere from six months to a year and some change. Um, by comparison, say a junior dev, um, let's look at somebody up here in this, in this quadrant. Um, maybe it takes you three months to hire them and it takes them six months to get up to speed. That's nine months, right? And so. Um, there's definitely some, some uh, I don't know, just like finding exactly where you fit and where your needs are and sort of also planning ahead and having realistic expectations to it. Um, the last thing on here is salaries. These are like ballpark numbers that I'm throwing out because I think these are reasonable places for folks in the Twin Cities to be paid. And the thing that I feel like most irks me is hearing junior devs get offers that are really low. And I feel like a comfortable starting salary for a junior developer, like entry level, it's like 70 grand. Right? And I feel like I'm hearing of people that get job offers in the 50s and the, in the like 60s. And I'm like, 70 isn't that much more. And it also puts them in a much better position to sort of uh, not be anchored to a low salary and get strung along um, from one year to the next when your company only gives you 2% raises. Um, so these are just, this is all numbers that came out of my head. It's not, they're not found in real data, but they're generally speaking sort of what I'm seeing. Okay, next, uh, next category is hiring is marketing. <coughs> and so the idea here is, is that like, you're, you're, if you're thinking about it like, oh, we need somebody butt in chair yesterday, um, you're not necessarily thinking about the bigger picture, which is that your hiring process is marketing for your business. Um, and if somebody has a great experience with your, with, their hire, with your interview process, whether they come to work for you or not, they're going to tell other people. Likewise, if somebody has a really crappy experience in your interview process, they're also going to tell other people. And so there's, there's definitely like a marketing component to this too, where if you think about the bigger picture, like what the, can, the entire candidate's experience looks like um, and make little minor improvements here or there, like the work you put into it is gonna go a long way. <clears throat> so think through the whole process. Um, and I'll get to this in a moment, but like I've heard of, uh, I've heard of some companies that have like really, really long, rigorous interview processes. And it's like, like, like six rounds of interviews. It's like, man, if you're, if you're gonna go through that much work, like this has to be like 100% aligned with like your personal like life goals or like they have to be paying you like a butt ton of money or like something that makes like all of that work worthwhile. And I feel like realistically, like it's not like you're getting married. <laughs> Right? Like this is a job where you get paid to work. It's not like, I don't know, it's, it's not worth spending that much time on anything. Um, so minimize steps in the process. That's my advice here. And this is an example from, uh, from Google that basically said any more than four interviews is a waste of time. I would argue that like the sweet spot is more like two to three interviews uh, where like you can feel out a person and a candidate and see if they're a good fit and get to the point of making a decision pretty quickly. And I feel like anything beyond that, I mean, to Google's point, is a waste of time. Um, this is something we're going we're to talk a little bit. There's a lot here to unpack, but um, 
I would strongly encourage you to have a structured interview process. Um, I, uh, before quitting my job to focus on the Invisible Network, I went, I went to go work for a startup here in town and they didn't really have a process. And it was like, I get it because it's a startup and they're still figuring this stuff out. But at the same time, it's like you reach a point where you need to have a process because when somebody's coming in to interview, you need to be able to tell them what's gonna, what to expect and what's gonna happen. And so here's an example sort of, of what my ideal process looks like. And this is sort of an amalgamation of many different um, experiences I've had both on the interviewing side and on the hiring side, which is to say, start it with like the, the standard HR recruiter phone screen. Then from there, uh, I, I interviewed at a company that did this thing where it was like a 30 minute video call with an engineering manager. And it was great because like, we jumped into, into like a, a web-based IDE editor thing where there were some failing tests in Ruby and he was like, all right, make, make the test pass. Took 10 minutes, right? And, and he was able to vet like, oh, this person knows Ruby. This person knows about TDD. Like this person can get, like this person gets it, right? And so that was only 30 minutes and it was a great sort of vetting process on both of our perspectives, right? Because he can be like, all right, here's somebody who actually knows the technology that they say they know. Um, and likewise, I can talk to the engineering manager for a little bit, like the person that I would be reporting to. Uh, the next step from there, assuming they pass the engineering screening, engineering manager screening, would be like an in-person interview with the team. Ideally, this would be like, it, it's long, like three to four hours is a long day, but that's way better than a lot of the alternatives. And so the two things that I do, that I would like, like if in a perfect world, what I would do is have two people do um, sets of interviewing questions where like you ask the same questions of every candidate and you're assessing for alignment with your engineering team's core values. Um, and so that's sort of like, that's, that's what, what you'd call culture fit, right? Like, is this person somebody that I could see myself working with and spending my time with on a daily basis? And then the next part of that is the, um, the technical assessment. Um, and I mean, we're gonna talk about coding exercises here in just a moment more, but um, the, the thing that I've seen mo be most successful is an in-person pair programming exercise. And the reason why that's great is beyond just like checking for technical competency and like ability to solve problems, uh, you have somebody else in the room who can make sure that the candidates like doesn't go on, like, like go way off on the wrong track, uh, stays on the right track. And you can also assess for other interpersonal stuff that you're not gonna get anything, anything like with, a, with like a take home coding exercise. Yeah? Yeah, I was just gonna say, what, what are your feelings on the take home versus the whiteboard versus the pair programming where, where you go? Cause I, I know that's touchy, but I'm, I'm very curious to know what you think. Yeah, so the question for the, for the video is, uh, what are my thoughts on in-person versus uh, pair programming versus whiteboard versus take home code exercises? And that'll literally be the next slide. So we'll talk about it more in just a moment. Uh, thank you for asking the leading question. Um, so in my experience, the best, the best possible way to, te to test for technical experience and knowledge and acumen is an in-person pair programming thing. And I feel like the things you get with that that you don't get anywhere else is, how does this person take feedback, right? And you can ask them to, to, to talk through their thought process, even if it's like all internal. Um, you can hear how they approach solving the problem and you can assess, you can just, I don't know, you, you get a lot more context than you would with just like a, here is a, here is a problem, did you solve it? Yes, no. Uh, after that three to four hour in-person team interview thing, um, hopefully the team gets together and huddles and makes a decision, yes, no. Um, and then from there, either you make an offer or you give them critical feedback on things that they can do to improve and why, like why they might not have gotten the job, and, and give them constructive information to use going forward. That's my ideal process. Like, and I, I also understand that like, getting a process like that together takes time. Like it takes a lot of, of time and energy. And like we went through this, this effort at my last company um, to establish a structured interviewing process. And it was an iterative thing. It wasn't like we got it right the first time. It was a sort of thing where we started with you know, a straw man and then we continued to improve on it as we went. And so this is the culmination of sort of everything that I've learned in my experience with that and my own personal interviewing experience too. Two questions. Yeah. One, do you like, does that assume that you've like ranked everybody and so the first person that you bring in for the in-person interview, you're actually ready to hire them at that, on that day? Uh, yeah, okay, so the question again for the, the video <coughs> is does that assume that, you're, that you've ranked everybody and so that you're able to make a decision quickly on that one person um, on that single day? Uh, <coughs> I'll, I'll say quickly, uh, 
what we did at my last company was like we we had like a like a whirlwind two weeks where we interviewed eight people in eight days yeah. which was exhausting but at the, the nice thing was that at the end of that eight day like we didn't we didn't huddle after every single day we huddled at the at the end of those eight days and we said all right let's like and this is also touches on things that i'm going to talk about more later but it's like let's let's put our scores in a spreadsheet for all these people on all these different things that we're where we're consistently asking the same questions every time um, and then discuss them all at, like together at the same time. And then that's when we made our, our decisions and we had our deliberation and whatnot. So that's answered to your first question. Second right. question. What's the value of the re recruiter phone screen in that process? I feel like, the, so the question is the, the, what's the value of the recruiter phone screen? Uh, and I feel like, I mean, this is the sort of thing where presumably you don't want to waste an engineering manager's time with every single person that comes through. And so, I mean, HR and recruiters, like it's kind of like their job to do the, the initial intake. And so my assumption is that's what they're doing in that 30 minutes is like assessing for the things that they say on their resume, like are those actually true? And do these people like, do they in some way, shape or form align with what the team is looking for? Other questions yet, Jason? Uh, regarding that part about uh, giving critical feedback, is that even normally given because, uh, yeah, uh, in, in my experience that's uh, yeah, specific feedback isn't given, and I'm guessing that it's because employers are uh, 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 are afraid of potential legal ramifications. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, <laughs> so the question was about if uh, if the reason why companies don't normally give feedback is because of legal ramifications, and I think the answer is yes. I don't know for sure, but I presume that that's the case. And we have we have a real life recruiter nodding her head saying yes. So I think that that's yes, the answer is yes. Great. They, they typically will try not to be as specific as possible. It also depends on the relationship that you have with the recruiter itself. So if, if you and the recruiter are open and honest with each other already, um, then, then likely they'll give you some feedback, but they try not to be as specific to give that. Okay, so again, for the video on the internet, the, the answer from the recruiter, uh, Christina, <laughs> who's awesome, uh, was that they try to avoid giving very specific feedback, specifically for those reasons. Right. Great. Yes, Josh. I was just going to highlight, you know, earlier you had kind of like the time breakdown and advantages and disadvantages in that of uh, more and less experienced candidates. How like this process is relatively streamlined and works well for a more junior candidate or a more junior position. Mm -hmm. For a more senior person, I would expect to spend a lot more time, like especially if you were looking at a team lead or like architect level, um, they, I would expect a lot more time and a lot more exposure to the team Whereas like, like a two person interview is, is pretty short for a senior inter senior candidate. Mm -hmm. For a junior candidate, it's actually a, an, an advantage that you can have a lighter process. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, and so just again for the video, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna just keep saying that. Uh, Josh made a, a very good point, which is this this is a very streamlined process and it's like specifically like works well for junior devs and for a senior dev, you'd expect more in-person FaceTime um, and that might have more touch points to it, right? Cool. Good point. Thank you. All right. I have a lot of slides. We're going to keep going. Uh, coding exercises. And this is one that I, I, I feel like maybe at the very end we can like spend more time on it if there is time. Um, but coding exercises, like how, how many of you have strong feelings about coding exercises? All right. Great. For the record on the video, like half of the room raised their hand. Um, okay. I have strong feelings about coding exercises too. Um, and the thing that irks me the most is take home coding exercises. And, uh, I'll give a quick anecdote example where I was given a take home coding exercise and this is like while I'm working full time, I'm interviewing at companies, uh, I'm told the, the coding exercise is going to be like two to take two to four hours and I'm given like a PDF with a couple pages of instructions and I read through the instructions and I'm like, all right, there's like a, there's a requirement section and then there's another section that's like what we want. <laughs> and so, th and they're like what they're saying they want versus what they actually ask for are completely different. And so I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to build a thing that I think they want based on what they've described. Spent a couple hours on that, built like a React front, and I'm like, all right, great, here's, here's the thing, right? And then I go to sleep, wake up the next morning, and I'm like, oh, crap. And now I get what they really wanted. Like, they wanted me to show my object-oriented experience. And so it's like, oh, that's something that where you don't even need to have an interface for that. So I, like, get up in the morning. I'm like, all right, this is only going to take a few hours. I end up spending the whole day, like, redoing it. And so I ended up building, like, a React front end with like a Rails back end and like almost talking together. And I was like, man, 
this is like a really impressive thing that I just spent like a whole weekend building. Uh, and when I would, like, was like trying to think about like, like sending it, like summarizing and sending it back to the company, my wife was like, you were miserable all day Sunday. Like you were miserable to be around. Like you put a damper on my weekend. And I was like, oh wow, I didn't even like pay attention to that. Like my wife pointing out that I was miserable is like, maybe I probably shouldn't go work for this company. <laughs> Uh, and so that's an anecdote to say like, there's time that you're gonna spend on a coding exercise, like a take home coding exercise uh, at the very uh, beginning on like design thinking, like how are you actually gonna do it? And if you're given a prompt, like you can use whatever languages or technologies you want, like leaving it open-ended like that really sucks. Cause the person who gave you the prompt is like, I know exactly what technology I'm gonna use. I know exactly what frameworks I'm gonna use to solve this very specific problem. And it'll take me like two hours coding. Right? That's them knowing exactly what they want and knowing exactly how to do it and then spending the time doing it. That is not the same time that, that like you send this to somebody else and they're going to be like, oh gosh, I had to think about how I'm going to approach that. And they might not know the exact right framework to use to solve that exact problem in that exact way. So there's design thinking sort of on the, on the, at the, on the front end. And then at the very end where you ask people to put into a readme like, what did you do and why? And then also communicate what you did and why via email. That also takes time, right? And so like I ended up spending probably like four hours thinking about how I was gonna solve it on the front end and then actually communicating what I did on the back end. And that was not even factoring in any of the 10 hours I spent coding. And it's like, here's a two to four hour coding exercise. Go forth, right? And th we haven't even gotten into, uh, this is time spent outside of work and I'm not getting paid. So like, if you're gonna give somebody a homework assignment like that, try to keep it as simple as possible, right? Try to try to like very concretely like leave no no room for vagueness, so that it's like here's exactly what I want you to do. Here's exactly the technology I want you to use. I want to see the outcome. That that's like a, a compromise. Like that's not ideal. Again, like an in-person pair program exercise is going to be a lot more well received and a better tool for you to use to assess people than a take-home one anyway. But sorry, I'll get off my pedestal. <laughs> but uh, that's 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 sort of my like quick feelings about coding exercises. Uh, yeah. A uh, question about uh, about asking about a GitHub repo. Um, I think, yeah, that's great. I feel like if, I mean, if you're an engineer and you have code out there on the internet somewhere, um, I feel like it's it's perfectly reasonable to have part of the engineering team who's going to be interviewing take a look at their code. Like, they've got stuff that they that they've already got and worked on and can speak to and can explain like the design decisions that they made and like some of the trade offs and like where they wish they spent more time to refactor and whatnot. Like, I feel like everybody has that. Like, not everybody has that, but like, engineers have that already. And so if you, if you tell people to come in, like, that's, that's, this is a great suggestion. Like, if you have people come in with code that they want to talk about and are ready to talk about already, then that's so much easier than giving them some like weird vague prompt that's not even related to the work that they're going to be doing if they come work for you anyway. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Rose. Yeah. That's a great point. I'll just reiterate it again for the video. Um, Sarah Rose pointed out that uh, there are a lot of things that are bad about take home exercises, but also there are things about um, coming in for in person interview, like in person peer programming or whatever, in person coding exercises or whiteboarding, where that can be very anxiety inducing. And understandably, it is very anxiety inducing. Like whether you're, whether you're like an introvert or an extrovert, like that's like putting you, putting you on the spot, it's, it's tough. Um, and so it's possible that a take home exercise might be a preference of a candidate. And so um, maybe that's something where you, you give them the option. You say, would you prefer a take home one or you, would you prefer doing one in person? And like giving two options. Again, I mean, setting, having, like setting up a coding exercise in itself takes a lot of work. And so giving multiple options could be like additional work too, but it's, it's, that's a good idea. It's a good suggestion. 
just to that note, all hiring processes are going to have a, they're going to select for a certain type, and in specific cases, <coughs> you just need to know what you're selecting for, because I, you know, I, you and I can talk about this later, but I think just knowing what the bias of your coding exercise is, mm -hmm. and saying we're comfortable with that because that's also part of our cultural bias here, mm -hmm. um, or knowing that you need to select against, we have enough of these, we need more, somebody who might prefer this. At, nothing's going to be perfect, but if you know why it's imperfect, you can strategize around that, mm -hmm. and either mitigate it or embrace it. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, summary for the video again is like, and I'm not gonna get this right, but um, is that, recognize that the way you do your technical assessment has a selection bias to it and you should be aware of that and, and pay attention to it and maybe reassess that too. Yeah. So I, I was just gonna, um, I think like when you're talking about your process and being upfront with folks, sharing that there is a pair programming exercise mm -hmm. in the interview process uh, lets people prepare, lets people, like if they are nervous, if they, they're going to take an anti-anxiety med or whatever, um, don't tell them like that they're coming in for a chat and then spring. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great point. Uh, Josh is just saying, uh, uh, and this segues nicely into the next slide, uh, which is just like clearly communicate what to expect so that like even if like a pair programming exercise in person is the sort of thing that will be an anxiety inducing, at least you know to expect it. And so you can plan accordingly. Uh, Thank you for the segue. I know that we're, we're running out of time here, but uh, we're gonna keep going quickly through. Uh, so to Josh's point, uh, clearly communicate what to expect so everybody can, can be on the same page and also know what to expect. Um, I've heard horror stories of people who were like, had an in-person interview scheduled for 45 minutes and there were three people on the invite and it was like gonna be an in-person interview and then like an hour before the interview, it got rescheduled or it got changed to like a video call. And I hear that and I'm like, God, that is like the worst possible way to try to interview somebody where like you, you don't clearly communicate what to expect. The, the candidate has to like make some guesses about what it's going to be like and then you end up changing at the last minute. Like everything about that is bad. Don't do that. Uh, so just making sure that you clearly communicate what to expect uh, as far in advance as possible was awesome. Also, I feel like this is the thing that, that just tends to come up. Like if you're going to if you're going to tell people, like, all right, you're interviewing with with these two people and then these two people and then these two people and then somebody's out sick that day and somebody else fills in, the least you can do is like let, let the candidate know that the person that they're gonna meet is different than the person that they've already like researched on LinkedIn. Um, I feel like th that's just like a, a little communicative thing, but um, that's also helpful to know when, when somebody changes in the, in the lineup, right? Um, <clears throat> this gets to the critical feedback point too. Uh, treat the people that you don't hire with respect. Um, so I feel like, I get that there are like legal ramifications if you give critical feedback, but my my like my gut my gut feeling is like if you have good intentions and you like try to give positive encouraging like feedback to people, they're gonna take it well. And so I would I'd rather not like like don't don't like withhold information just because you're worried about a lawsuit. Like that just feels crappy to me. And I don't know. I, I get I get that this is like a touchy subject, but one thing. Um, so the one thing is give critical feedback to people that you interview and don't hire. The other thing is try to respond to everybody who applies, right? Like if you have a, a, an application online and people apply online and then you literally never respond to them and they get no, like, they don't even get a message saying that, that like we got your application, that really sucks, right? It's like you're, you're throwing your resume, you're like putting yourself out there and like it's almost like you're shouting into the void and you never hear anything back. That blows. And so, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and so I, I feel like this is the sort of thing where even if it's like a canned message where you've got a template, right? A personal email where you just say, hey, just want to let you know, we got your application. We're sorry we didn't like, we didn't bring you in for any interviews or anything, but we wanted to let you know, like, here's closure for that application you sent out. Uh, so just, I mean, these are people. Treat people like people. Treat them with respect. Like, they're not just numbers, right? They applied online. Like, and if you've got such a messed up, hiring an application process where you don't even look at anybody who applies online, you probably have other things to, to like, that need help too, right? <laughs> Question? Yeah, I just wanted to mention it. It can get really difficult to give 
personalized feedback when you start getting 100 or 150 people applying for a position. So what I, I've tried to find a compromise where I send out a letter or an email saying, people usually fell, fell into like, you know, one of these three categories and, and you know, and, and, and try to, it's still kind of general feedback, but it's a little bit better than, you know, hey, sorry, we just, we hired someone else. Uh, and, and it's not a great solution, but it's kind of like a better than nothing solution. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd be really interested to hear if other people had either better ways to do that. I try to give, if anyone who's in, comes in for an interview, I will give, try to give personal feedback for it. But other than that, it's, it's, it's really hard sometimes with the numbers, especially since code schools started. <laughs> yeah. Um, code you know, places like Prime started, it's just, if you get a lot, you get, like, of the whole class there will apply for your job, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the general comment was that, like, it's good to give personalized feedback, but it's also a challenge when you have a lot of people applying. Yeah. And that, you, I guess your suggestion is to sort of, like, group them into buckets as far as, like, why you didn't consider that maybe, and, like, try to give something more, mm -hmm. more clear than just, hey, sorry, we didn't hire you, uh, just so you know, we didn't hire you. <laughs> <laughs> we got to keep moving. So, uh, does it, unless anybody has like a really, really hot thing that they want to say, um, I'm going to keep moving. Okay. Well, can we come back to you, Jason? Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, diversity and inclusion in hiring. Uh, there is a session on uh, why diversity matters, and it's at one o'clock, and you should all go to that. I have another <laughs> session at one o'clock, uh, and like, I would prefer that you go to the Why Diversity Matters session at 1 o'clock <laughs> over my other session. But diversity inclusion is really important. And this is the sort of thing where like, people say they care about diversity inclusion, but, they, like, but their actions don't reflect that. And I feel like a lot of people in the room probably have feelings about that, right? Myself included. Um, OK, so first, is, first things first, recognize that you have unconscious and or implicit bias. Uh, Everyone does. Like that's that's a thing. That's normal. It's okay to have that. Um, I looked up the the definitions of uh, of unconscious versus implicit so that I made sure I, I said it the right way. And unconscious bias is the stuff you don't know about that affects your behavior, whether you know about it or not. And implicit bias is when you actually know about it and you continue to like your 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 behavior continues to be different as a result of that. I could be getting that completely wrong, but I feel like general like big picture. That's sort of like the summary of what. What we're talking about here. Uh, so, n acknowledging that you have bias, uh, if you use a consistent evaluation criteria, that's a really good strategy for reducing bias in your process. So, we were talking about how you assess, um, like when we had eight junior devs come in in eight, eight days, we had a spreadsheet. Uh, and we had a spreadsheet where we consistently scored candidates on questions. So, like, it's like you, we worked backwards from, you started with engineering core values. And from there, we created questions that aligned with, does, the, does this speak to a person's alignment with, our core with that core value? From there, it was like a, we're going to give it a score of like a zero, one, or two. So like zero means no, one means yeah, kind of, and two means yes, strong yes. And so when you've got questions that align with your values, then you consistently ask the same questions to every candidate. You score them consistently. And then at the end, you have numbers that you can refer to instead of just gut feelings. Um, and so that's, that's sort of what I mean by using consistent evaluation criteria. Um, and to your question about like making a decision like day of after interviewing someone, it's ideal if you, if you can like put numbers to paper and then come back to them later. And that way like you're like sort of like, there's no emotion in, and there's no like sort of gut feelings in there. I mean, there are gut feelings, but it's like a little bit further removed from literally day of after you met somebody like I liked them, I didn't like them. Whew. I feel like I'm talking a mile a minute, but we've got a lot more slides still. Uh, okay, so this is something that I, I hear and it's so frustrating is companies will say, we're looking to hire developers, we're looking for experience, but we also care about diversity. Uh, have any of you like, how, how many of you like feel that way? How many of you like have heard that before? Okay, all right, quite a few. So I feel like what I wanna do when I, when I like hear that is I wanna like, I wanna shake them and be like, you're being an asshole. Like, sorry for swearing, but like that's that's what I want to just like tell you, tell them straight up. Um, and the reason why I say that is like having run Minneapolis Junior Devs for the last two years, there's a very diverse pool of junior talent here in the Twin Cities, right? 
And if you say, we'll, we're hiring developers, but we only want experience, you are further perpetuating the sort of gender and, uh, and ethnicity and demographic imbalance that currently exists in software. Uh, I went searching for visuals for like numbers to speak to this. And the best data I could I found was from Stack Overflow. So take this all with a grain of salt. But <clears throat> I, what I what I want to what I want to say is, if you care about diversity, at the very least, be open to hiring junior. And I'll say that again: like, be open to hiring junior if you care about diversity. And the reason why this is important is, <clears throat> sure, at the very top there are people, like, the purple the the dark purple is white males. And then the, uh, the lighter purple is white non-males, the dark orange is people of color male, and then the light orange is people of color non-male. Um, these are all white dudes, right? Like, this is the, like white dudes represent the majority of software engineers, right? And as you go up from less experience to more experience, you see that the most experienced people are white dudes. It's like, sure, if you don't want to hire a white dude, be open to hiring somebody who's not very, very experienced, right? I feel like this, this like, I've seen this. Ha I've seen these trends in the last couple of years, and it's like it feels so obvious and apparent. But companies perpetually prioritize experience over diversity, and I feel like that's something where, sort of like, needs to change. Um, uh, reassessing where you find candidates. So, if you care about diversity and inclusion, and you only hire white dudes, um, maybe try looking elsewhere for people who aren't white dudes or like change your criteria, like evaluation criteria or just change where you, where you look or change where, you, where your pool of applicants comes from. Um, again, we, we talked a little bit already about um, like application processes and like people applying online and like essentially ignoring people that apply online and, and like what I hear a lot of is, is um, priority going to people who are internal referrals as compared to people who apply online. Um, I mean, this, this is also anecdata, like this is what I hear, this, doesn't, this isn't like something that I have numbers to. Um, but if you reassess where you find candidates, you might be able to find people who don't continue to perpetuate the current state of your team. And so this is a, a shameless plug. Uh, this is what the Invisible <laughs> Network is. Uh, the Invisible Network is the, um, it's the side project turned sustainable business that I started in December, um, and I recently quit my job to focus on. Um, the idea here is that it's a place where if you're looking for work, you can anonymously share that you're looking for work without alerting your current employer that you're looking and also without getting spammed by recruiters on LinkedIn. Um, and then on the flip side, and like this is the thing I, I mentioned second, but I think it's actually the most important thing here, is this is a place where employers can reduce bias in their hiring. So there, there's a list of people on the site, not jobs. And there's like there are short blurbs about who they are and what the role is that they're looking for. And that's kind of all you get until you request, like an employer requests an introduction. And then what happens after that is I'll run the, the answers from the employer by the job seeker. And if there's mutual interest, I'll make an introduction. So like their privacy is protected. They can do it like an anonymous job search without alerting their employers. And so like from the perspective of the job seeker, like this is a no brainer, like add yourself to the site if you're looking. Um, but on the employer side, instead of like passively like opening up a job posting and then waiting for people to come to you, this is a place where you can go to find those people. So that's my shameless plug. Sorry to, uh, to aggressively pitch you there. Um, but there are other places you can go to find candidates too, right? There are a ton of boot camps here in town, Prime and Software Guild and UMM Boot Camp. Um, I mean, there are, there are like technical schools and community colleges and whatnot too. And I, all the places that I'm listing are all places where you can go to find junior talent. And if you, if you can't already tell, like I have a strong preference for hiring junior. And so that's sort of like, that's the culmination, like last point that I'm gonna try to make here uh, with my presentation. We got four minutes, so I'll try to be quick. <clears throat> uh, so put your employees in a position to succeed. Um, this is like a billion dollar idea that I'd love to hand to somebody, and I would love to see somebody in town do it and do it well. Um, imagine if like getting a job at your company was like a golden ticket for a junior dev, right? Where you get the job and you get everything you possibly need like you you get resources devoted to you getting onboarded and trained you get mentorship and like the career trajectory once somebody gets a job at whatever company is like you just it's exponential through the roof up into the right right uh, i haven't heard of a company in town doing like this exact thing well yet i've heard of ch robinson with the hatchery 
and they have like a boot camp sort of thing built into like they hire junior and then there's like a training program that goes into it um, also I've heard of uh, Genesis 10 like a consulting shop where they um, I think that they they hired they, they had the software guild doing like a boot camp sort of thing to get them ramped up and ready to be software consultants um, like those are two examples who like are doing a good job with it but like they there there there's room to be doing even better um, and so like if you think about like potentially like the golden ticket being getting a job at NPR or Foundry or somewhere else like that would be huge beyond just uh, beyond just like giving back to the community and hiring junior and getting and like giving them uh, everything they need to be successful but it also helps from like a marketing perspective and from a branding perspective and that you know getting that job at that company is a golden ticket like that's huge right so that's my free billion dollar idea um, clearly articulate your career development steps um, how do you level up uh, at foods we when I was working there one of the things one of the projects that I worked on was establishing the the software engineering ladder and so it was like associate software engineer mid-level software engineer, senior software engineer and then staff and then principal and the important thing wasn't just that there were titles and that it was clear what the titles were the important thing was was to articulate what it means to be at that level and so we had a couple of different like tracks where it was like all right, you're strong here, but you're weak here, but you're strong here. And so like to get to the next level, you need to, you need to like focus on this one thing that you're weak in. And so I feel like having clear uh, definitions about how you level up is, is a really smart thing as far as retaining your employees. Uh, again, retaining your employees pay well and give frequent raises, right? Otherwise they're gonna leave in one to two years. I mean, in, in Paul DeBetting's session on hiring and why recruiters suck, like. If you don't pay well, people are gonna leave because that's how you get a big payday. That's how you get a big pay bump. Like when I changed jobs, I got like a 20 something percent pay raise just because I got like a 2% raise and a 5% raise in two years. And then I go work somewhere else and I get a way bigger payday. Like that's just like, that's how it works, which is crappy because like you've done all this, like you, you've got an employee who's spent like many years working at your company. They've got all this tribal knowledge. They know the ins and outs of how your products work. And they're probably like really talented. Like if they've stuck around this long, they're good engineers. You don't want to lose them, so why the heck don't you pay them a market rate? Because they're going to leave otherwise. Uh, be open-minded. Okay, lightning round. There's the last couple more, couple more slides. Uh, so on your job descriptions, remove those arbitrary requirements. Things like uh, you need to have a college degree or like you need like 10 years of React experience, for one. <laughs> Some of those things are just completely unrealistic. But for two, like you're limiting your pool of applicants for no reason. Like take, take a look at what's on your job description and like get rid of like the stupid number of years where you're like oh you have to have two years to uh to come work here you have to have 10 years of experience to come work here like you don't you need to be able to do the work and so if you if you think about it that way like assess for that like communicate that uh be open to remote i think uh oh yeah Plus, 100% remote. 100 remote? Yep. all right if you need a job go uh, if you want a remote job go talk to this guy over here in the yeah, orange yeah, yeah, yeah. Z zapier Zapier.com. Okay, awesome. Yeah, be open to remote because there's no reason for people to be 40 hours a week butt in chair, right? And I, I won't talk about that anymore. Uh, <laughs> last, okay, this is my closing point: is hire junior and be open to hiring junior um, and promote from within. And so this is sort of the culmination of all the things that we just talked about. Um, the case for hiring junior is that there's a large pool of diverse candidates. They're motivated and eager to learn. Uh, the time it'll take less time for you to hire them because there are so many. Um, you can mold them into be exactly what you need, which is to say they're a blank canvas and they don't already have bad habits, which can be a really good thing. Uh, uh, what I already touched on, the, the, the golden ticket idea, if you establish a really good training and onboarding program, that it can just be really, really good branding for your business. Um, and that landing a job at your company could become the golden ticket, which would be amazing, right? Uh, just from a sheer monetary perspective, you could hire two junior devs to the price of one senior. and so. Even if you're paying them well, if you're paying junior devs at 70K and you're paying a senior at 140, you can hire two junior devs for the price of one. Uh, also, you're giving back to the community. Uh, and that's important to say because where do you think junior dev, where do you think experienced devs come from? Experienced devs of tomorrow are the junior devs of today. And so as, as like a, a community, we all need to like pay attention to how can we help junior devs level up because there's a huge pool of junior devs right now and if we don't support them and give them the help that they need, they might end up just dropping to, like software engineering entirely and, and ending up in a different career just because they didn't have what they needed to continue to grow in that, on that path. So that's 
sort of it. Uh, there's not really time for questions, but uh, I want to say thank you very much for coming to my session. Uh, I know you're all hungry.